Okay, it's the 8190's turn. Following on from the video I've just done on restoring this 8290, we're going to get on to this one. This is the Show Pony. Um, this, as mentioned in the previous video, um, cost the owner uh, a considerable amount of money. Uh, I won't disclose how much, but uh, a lot of money, because this is, for all intents and purposes, new old stock. He's got the original box, packaging, manuals, even a sales brochure, and I think the sales receipt, um, and it is immaculate. It has one um, notable minor fault that I've been told about. Um, the meter switch on the top, meter and light switch, uh, when you pull it forward, which on this model actually latches forward, on the later model, it's just a momentary spring. Um, it should light up two bulbs above the uh, tuner dial and the bulbs don't light. Given the condition and evident lack of use of all the rest of it, I suspect it's just the switch that's at fault, not the bulbs. Um, but we're going to have a look at this one and um, have a look at that issue. And the tape deck, I'm told, does work on this. Everything works fine. I'm told there's a little bit of crackling which we'll look at. Um, so the belts are seemingly okay, but I'm going to open this one up just the same as I did with that one and actually check if the belts are original or appear to be. Uh, if they look remotely questionable, um, I think we're going to order a full new set. These 8190s use five belts in the tape mechanism. The tape mechanism in the 8290 is slightly revised and it only uses four belts. There's quite, actually quite a bit of revision uh, between the two decks, even though they look fairly similar. You will notice, not on this shot, but on certain other um, shots, you've got um, more buttons on the front uh, of the 81 than the 82, because the 81 has separate stop and eject controls. So the decks were revised, most likely due to manufacturing cost. They meet the same spec and they're the same quality but they were a little more simplified for manufacture in the 82. So this is the original 81 deck with five belts we're going to look at and I'll try and focus on some of the differences. And even though everything on the internet says, oh, they're the same, they're very much not. Uh, so we're gonna look at this and see if we can get uh, a kit of five belts. And again, the owner's got several of these, I think he's actually got four of these including one that's very scrappy for a spares machine and I think two of the 82 uh, including this one so again we're going to uh, measure this all up and then I'm going to look to work on uh, the other machines that he's got and order spare parts for those as well so let's get on with this one so let's just see what this one does uh, I'm told Let's say that it works. I'll take some of it. Very crappy volume control there. demonstrate that actually on the 82 that I repaired, I don't think, but um, they did work fine. Um, of course that's just the cool volume, so Good test the radio, I've not got the antennas up, so... Tomorrow evening at 9 here on Classic FM. Radio seems to work okay on FM at least, I'm not going to go completely through everything on there. But obviously the tape's working, um, counter's moving, that feels a lot better than it did in the old one. So that is running uh, in essence. Um, 
we need to have a look at these uh, crackly controls and then see if we can look at these switches. I think I might do these first before I even open it up just to see if we can improve that. Let's just see if before we even take it apart we can sort this volume control problem out. With a wee squirt of the good stuff. Actually feels like more like the wiper isn't touching the track properly. Moving it sideways. The other one doesn't do that, so you may have to remove that part. And yeah, take a look at the wiper on that. I've also just pulled off the lever of this switch and I'm just going to see if giving it a little shot nope that's not working either actually just going back to this now that the stuff's had a little bit of time to just work through and I've turned the volume up and down it's not doing it anymore so I'm going to remove all of the uh, switch levers on these and rubber gloves really help. You just have to pull them straight up and they, uh, they pull off. The worst one I've ever done for this is a Panasonic I've got where you have to remove the volume and tone knobs to get the back off and they're so difficult. You have to remove all the others as well just as we did on the last model because I think I'm going to have to look at this top board to uh, have a look at a couple of these so just as we did on the last one eject the uh, tape door we're going to remove this cover and then carefully remove the uh, front door Wait, I've just spotted something. Do you see those down in there? I think that's polystyrene balls. Yeah. <laughs> that's bits of bits of polystyrene <laughs> some packaging. That's really weird. I can't quite get that one, it's no biggie, but what the heck is that? The heads are still a little bit murky on this one, so I'm just going to try again some isopropanol. I can see some, yeah, I can see a little bit of muck on the capstan there. And the pinch roller wants the soapy water on it as well. So let's do the do. Let's take all the screws out. Notice we've got one on the back of this, so it was done by the owner. I actually found this screwdriver, which is not a JS screwdriver, it was better. The last one I tried for getting these out, so I'm going to use this one. And like before, I'm going to completely remove these. I'm not just going to loosen them. Uh, yeah, same thing, look, the sponge is going, so we'll replace that as well. Again, battery springs look perfect. That was harder to do than the last one. 
<laughs> and we've got the same wires connected. So I can see a couple of screws that are still in there. They just refuse to come out. And here we have the insides of the uh, 8190, which in most ways look more or less the same uh, as the uh, internals of the 82. Definitely on the radio section, I don't think anything's changed there. Uh, at least we've got a ferrite rod in one piece this time. And um, same Dolby uh, module and same um, couplet module here. I'm not sure what that is exactly, but that was... Uh, in exactly the uh, same place in the uh, 8290. The um, electronics of this board will be slightly different because um, as I explained before the 8290 was revised for metal tape recording compatibility. This can only play metal tapes. It can't um, set the bias current high enough for metal tape recording. It will only record on type 2 tapes at best. Um, something at the bottom here looks different to what we had on the uh, 8290. I'm not actually sure what that is. There's a diode across them in there. Is it some kind of solenoid? Possibly. And just as before, just down here we've got the headphone jack board. And I imagine under the front there somewhere we should have the uh, D DRPS board. So the whole sub chassis is loose, um, again just the same as the 8290, so if we pull that out this way we should be able to get access to the switchboard on top. That doesn't actually look too bad to get to actually, I'm noticing a couple of cable retainers in similar places. This is, I'm surprised at this, this is kind of equally messy as much as the uh, last one was in the 8290 so maybe that is just the way they do it but not sure. The motor wires are soldered on again and I don't see evidence of them being cut and then re-soldered in the way that they were on the last one I worked on so uh, they are soldered in again. The headphone board wire is soldered in again. This wire for the speakers uh, is on a plug so we need to disconnect that one and the same cable retainer down at the bottom but yeah actually it doesn't in, in terms of cable routing it doesn't look that different uh, I'm kind of surprised at that I think I might have been wrong all along I've just got this propped up and that bulb looks blown to me and just looking at the other that may possibly be as well um, looking at the circuit diagram the bulbs are in parallel but there's a capacitor C510 uh, that I wonder if that's shorted out or something that's taken them out because it's kind of weird that they blow um, they're a kind of wire ended bulb as well so um, I'm going to have to take this felt off to make that access a little easier so it's what to do about replacing that uh, so there's some blue wires that come back into this switchboard and that's where the um, uh, lamps are powered from and there's another little white polystyrene ball there <laughs> these things are everywhere in fact yeah there's loads of them I can see actually in the bottom of the case it's absolutely full of little bits of white polystyrene <laughs> so I need to clean all those out there's one right here um, yeah, so uh, I need to work out something about this bulb situation then. Um, I think I'll try and find the point where it comes from, measure some voltages, and probably do it directly from there actually, and uh, see what's going on with uh, that circuit. I've just cut one of the blown bulbs off and just uh, measured it on uh, my calipers, and it's a 4.2 millimeter bulb. It's most likely a 12 volt bulb. I'm just going to tin the ends of these uh, wires and it stands to reason that one of these should be uh, ground so I'm going to tin them and then I'm going to measure the continuity and I can find my meter 
Yeah. And then I may power this up and just double check that voltage, but 12 volt bulbs in 4.2 millimeter or 4 millimeter near enough. Uh, wire ended bulbs that he sold basically are still available so if we soldered and heat shrunk them we'd end up with exactly what we started off with so that should be fine there we go that is ground I just touched the centre contacts of the speaker so that side is ground let me mark that yeah this bulb is blown on that Norwegian wood. Even though I wouldn't be able to do it in shot because I'm a little bit cramped for space here, I managed to um, power this up off the bench power supply, uh, measure the voltage, and it was about 10 volts, uh, a little bit over. So um, I've ordered some 12 volt bulbs that should uh, replace those final uh, solder and heat shrink them on, and then that should get that sorted. Crikey, this is a complex one then. Um, you can see compared to the 8290 we've got this extra belt uh, that crosses underneath the uh, counter belt but it's um, not the only thing that's going on there's a myriad of rubber uh, tired nylon pulleys there is a nylon pulley here with a brass sort of tire around it if you like another nylon pulley with a rubber tire um, the brakes on the reels are different to how the 8290 was um, yeah there's a lot going on in the front there before I've even taken it out and looked at the other side um, it's got a plastic motor mount um, the same as the uh, 8290's got so I think the screws are in the same place with one two three and four I don't see on this one a ground strap actually unlike the 82 I think there's just a wire retainer there I don't see a black ground wire coming off that we'll uh, find out if there's one anywhere else might make that a little bit easier to take off um, but yeah it looks like the counter belt's the same because it's the same counter about the same pulley I'm sure around the, um, the take up uh, hub and um, they're the same distance so I think at least the counter belt's the same I think the main, um, I think the main capstan belt on the flywheel as well should be the same because the motor position should be the same and the flywheel diameter should be the same so I'm pretty sure there's at least two there but this one, um, I'll just take this off this is quite small quite small belt this one there we go so yeah that belt is it's not really dry but it's obviously keeping a, a shape so um, but that is quite a small belt it's about the size I'd say that most sort of CD and DVD trays uh, use okay it's I'd say it's a little bit bigger um, just to compare the two yeah it's probably f five mil or so bigger in diameter five to six mil perhaps bigger now this DVD belt looks to be about 25 mil in diameter so I think the other one's about a 30 mil belt yeah if it was if it was actually round yeah if it was actually round I'd say that's about a 30 mil belt so let's have this transport out then, so... No, there's definitely no ground strap on that one. So again, all the screws from transport are the same. Standard self-tappers. We've got a little wire retaining hook down the side here. That's a bit easier to deal with than the uh, 82's retaining hooks and uh, we have got yeah the ones down at the bottom there as well these are the tricky ones
Okay. So not, not super easy on this one. I've had to just lift up the handle and balance the uh, the mechanism on there because I can't completely turn it over. There's quite a bit more wiring, or rather, there's wiring from more angles, I think, than uh, there was on the 8290. So without really unrooting a lot of this, it's probably difficult to get the mechanism to turn over completely. However, we've got clear access to it, but I've just spotted something. I think. This has definitely had a belt kit because these, I don't think these belts are original. They feel okay on the back. But look at this. This is um, melted belt goo. And I can see a little bit of it around the uh, pulley on the motor as well. So this has been done, but I don't think this has been properly cleaned. Um, the belts don't touch this, so it's not an immediate problem, but I mean, I wouldn't have left that there. I would have got the alcohol on that, not acetone, but I would have got alcohol on that to get that off. And the pulley, well, the pulley's brass, so if you're careful, the acetone would be fine. But I can see a definite stripe around there where um, one of the belts has gone. So rather than all three belts connecting to the uh, motor pulley like the AT290 did, uh, with only two, and then this one connects to the pulley underneath this one. Um, again, yeah, I think the uh, capstan belt, the flywheel belt, is the same. I need to refer back to the footage of the uh, 8290, but I think this one again, this looks about the same to me. I think the distance is about the same, so there's at least two belts. So I think it's probably this belt, I think we may need to uh, take off and measure. And that little belt on the front that are different um, in this kit, but that's your five. So three on the back, two on the front. The little board that I mentioned on the bottom here uh, seems to be a bank of leaf switches. And there's also, uh, I know you can't see it from this shot, but uh, there's also um, behind, it might be the play button, there's a little uh, micro switch uh, bolted to a bracket just by that as well. And they all connect into this little board. So that's possibly something to do with uh, sensing for the uh, DRPS system I'm not certain but uh, I would guess that's slightly what it's for this is something I noticed on the uh, the other machine there's a cutout in the board here for a large a relatively large electrolytic capacitor which would probably be tiny these days but rather than attaching it directly to the board in this gap um, both of these machines I've seen now attach it by either little wires or maybe just leaving the legs on the capacitor longer and then sort of heat shrinking them or covering them in this strange uh, tubing stuff and kind of having it halfway out of the board I'm, I'm not sure what that's about um, you'd think if the cutout was there that's what they do perhaps um, this cutout is a bit too small um, maybe that's it maybe the, the cap is just a bit too tall and they only discovered this uh, in production or they had to switch to a different cap for availability which was a bit taller and by slightly bodging it like that it was the only way to get around it but it doesn't half look odd so how's about we do a proper job of cleaning this pulley that's a bit more like it Okay, so there's been a few delays, but I've finally got a set of bulbs and a set of belts. Um, as mentioned in some of my other videos, I've been back and forth with Deck Tech. They're not a sponsor of this video by any means, but um, they've sent me this um, belt drive sample kit uh, with seven belts, actually not five, because there's a couple of belts, I think namely the capstan belt and one of the um, winding belts on the front that we're not certain of the size so we're going to try these to get a definitive set that would fit the 8190 and then um, when I've sorted that out I can report back to them and they can hopefully put an 8190 kit up for sale. First two have been done on the front uh, counter belt and this drive belt here. I had to clean all four of the pulleys quite a bit because there was um, quite a bit of residue from where the old belts were starting to dry out. It's really important that you try and do that whenever you uh, do a belt swap, that you get all the old crap off. 
Um, I went with the smaller belt on the drive belt, uh, it does seem to be the best fit. This is um, a bit thicker than the original belt, but it doesn't foul anything, it doesn't seem to cause any problems. It was a bit difficult, bit difficult to get it on without um, getting a twist in it, uh, with it being a smaller belt. The smaller ones seem more prone to twisting, I'm not sure why. But uh, it's, on, it's on there now and it's okay. Um, seems to work fine, the counter belt again. Seems to work fine. So I've given some of this a clean up, I'm happy with that. I'm going to move on to the belts at the back. First two on the back, ignore the capstan belt for now, that's the old one. I've got to remove this bracket to get that out. I don't want to cut it on this one because I do want to compare that against the ones that have been sent. Um, but the two on the back, again, pulleys have been cleaned. Um, the motor pulley was cleaned previously. And uh, these are actually the same as the set from the 8290, although the orientation is slightly different. The distances are more or less the same. So uh, you've got a sub pulley underneath this one that this belt is around, and then this one goes to the bottom pulley of the motor. So there are only two pulleys on the motor on the 8190. On the 82, as we saw in the previous video, there are three. Uh, so all three belts come off the motor pulley on the 82, but on this, only uh, one of them does, well two of them do I should say, uh, including the capstan belt, so uh, that's all working fine. Again quite tricky to get them on without getting twists in them, but I managed to do it. So to remove the bracket that will allow me to get the capstan belt off, I've got to remove this screw, if you can see that there. It's a bit trickier than I thought. Around about here, just above my finger, there's a second screw, so both ends of the bracket. Just real quick to add to that, a bit of good news, you don't have to remove it, just loosen it enough and the bracket will kind of pivot and you can just sneak the belt underneath. You don't have to take it out completely because I imagine it would be an absolute nightmare to get back in. So the one on the end you definitely do have to remove because of the angle it's got to move. But the one right underneath the leaf switch is just loosen it and then just tighten it back down when you're done. Okay, I've managed to get the um, capstan belt on. I actually tried both sizes that I'd been sent for this and this is the slightly larger one. And I would say completely unscientifically that I remember, I think I mentioned it in the 8290 video, when I initially put the capstan belt on it, it felt a tiny bit slack. but um, while the smaller belt was a tiny bit tighter, I guess you don't want too much tension on this because this pulley has a slight camber to it and if the belt's too tight it can cause the belt to wander sideways so it's got to ride in the centre of that camber and if there's too much tension on the belt then you will get probably wow and flutter and you've already got two belts bear in mind on this pulley so we don't want too much tension on it but um, the squeaking sounds coming from the case, by the way. Um, but that feels, I think that feels roughly about the same as it felt on the 82. It didn't feel ever so tight, but it was working well. So, and it's definitely riding in the centre of the, the pulley, okay. So I'm thinking, as this is the same size as the one that went on the 8290, and that worked quite well. I'm thinking I might go with this one and try it just to see uh, what the performance is like. Okay, so I've bolted the uh, transport back in and there's a bit of a cobble going on here, a bit of a balancing act, but um, I just want to show something on the scope. In the front, my um, alignment test tape is in and it's in play at the moment, although the power isn't on. I'm going to point you at the scope and I'm going to pop the power on on the bench power supply and you'll see what I mean. So if I put the power on, that's both channels just as we were monitoring it last time from the 8290 and it's uh, it's working okay, looks stable, that's a one kilohertz tone but if you notice the frequency at the bottom it's slightly down. And I did wonder with that tape I'd recorded on the 8290 when I played it on this, it sounded fractionally slow. So I need to tweak the motor speed, which is a, a pot inside the motor, ever so slightly to get that to lock into about 1k. Other than that, um, that looks pretty steady. And that is monitoring both channels straight over each other. 
and they look like they're tracking pretty well so I think the performance of it should be fine but it just needs a tweak on the speed just giving that a little tweak that seems pretty good there now next thing to look at then is these bulbs and I just want to show something on the circuit diagram here so um, here's a supply that comes into the bulbs there's the two resistors on the top board and the bulbs are both in parallel now this capacitor uh, what this does is it's uh, connected to the power supply permanently and it maintains a charge so that when the uh, bulbs are turned on or off. For one thing it doesn't make the power supply pop so it acts as a smoothing capacitor um, but it also slowly discharges the bulbs uh, when the power is disconnected. Now if you were to replace the bulbs with LEDs and increase the value of these resistors what you probably find is that as the capacitor discharges the LEDs will go out very slowly because they pull much less current than a, a couple of incandescent bulbs do. Uh, so if you were ever to mod one of these for LED, you'd possibly have to swap that for a, a smaller capacitor. This is a 22 microfarad 16 volt. Um, so you probably have to change that for something like a 4.7 or a 2.2. Um, you could experiment to see whatever would work best if you ever do an LED mod of this. Um, luckily I'm not, I'm swapping them for the incandescent bulbs that should be the same but that just points out that little bit of the circuit there so yes the bulbs are in parallel and uh, I'm going to try it, swapping them over now and see how we get on alright I'm sorry if this is a bit shiny I've put a little bit of foil underneath this to do these bulbs because I don't want uh, anything to damage this felt underneath my plan is with these bulbs, yes they're taped to the top of a crocodile clip, not in the crocodile clip. That's because I think the tension on these are a bit too high and they might crack the bulb. Obviously I don't want that because I've only got a couple of them. So the plan is, I've tinned very close to the, uh, the bulb itself. The wires on these wire end bulbs are quite long. and I'm going to try and get these as close as I can to the bulb, solder them on and then I've got some bits of heat shrink pushed to the other end of the wire that I'm going to pull up and then heat shrink so that they won't touch because the wires are ever so close together. So let's see if we can have a go. Just as well I've got that heat shrink because I noticed the insulation that wire did not shrink back. So now I need to crop the excess and then pull up this heat shrink and heat shrink it. Bulbs. So I've just got to glue those in. We should be good to go. Okay, so mechanically, I think I'm happy so far, but I've spotted a couple of electrical issues and they may be down to dirty switches. Um, I noticed that when I switch to FM radio, which I'm on at the moment, I'm just detuned so that I don't hit a station, the left channel would dip down completely after about five seconds. And I've turned it off for a bit, wiggled a couple of switches, turned it back on, and now it's not doing it, the channels are staying even but I've noticed if I wiggle the band switch especially medium wave and short wave listen to that so I think we've got some dirty switches um, the function selector might want looking at as well because I noticed my test tape that looked fine earlier when I played that on the scope um, again the left channel was coming down a little bit so uh, I think I need to clean all the switches next uh, and see if that improves things. Excuse lunch cooking in the background. Here's a small sample of uh, things that came out of it. <laughs> These polystyrene balls. <laughs> and just to point out a couple of things that have been uh, maintained and cleaned. Uh, as I said earlier, the uh, band switch was causing uh, some issues. So 
uh, this has had a clean, the recording play switches have had a clean, the mode selector switch has been cleaned, and the um, line and phono switch. There's something I want to point out on this. Um, when you've got the back on, it's um, a little more evident in this, but this switch line phono switch, because it's above these two phono sockets, you may think in modern parlance of most auxiliary cables having two phonos on the end, that this switch would just switch the preamp in and out. So you could either use these sockets with a turntable with the preamp in as a ground strap if you needed ground wire, or with just a regular aux cable as people call it, uh, in there. You actually can't. This tripped me up. I forgot to mention this in the uh, 8290 video that I did. Um, this tripped me up because I thought this switch was faulty because when I switched it to line these sockets went dead. But you notice I'm using the uh, DIN connector. It doesn't turn the preamp in and out. The preamp is permanently wired to these sockets. The switch actually selects between phono input and line input on the DIN socket so it switches between the two sockets it doesn't turn a circuit in and out so you can't bypass the pre a phono preamp on these sockets you have to use the DIN socket and um, I've just got one of these um, DIN to four phono connectors uh, that you can get them with sockets on instead if you prefer to have uh, another wire connect into them you can get them in quite short if you want a sort of pigtail uh, style arrangement for connecting something up but yeah you have to use a DIN socket and DIN sockets weren't really that commonly used uh, especially in the UK so it's often a bit of a mystery connector on the back of uh, kind of 70s and 80s hi-fi gear I think it was more commonly used in Europe um, but on a lot of stuff I've seen for years it was just kind of a mysterious connector um, until uh, I've managed to get hold of a cable and actually try one and for this it is essential if you want to use this as an amplifier for uh, you know an iPod or a phone or CD player or any kind of line input you have to use switch it to line and you have to use the DIN socket with the correct cable and then you'll be fine it also gives line output so um, it bypasses the tone controls the loudness even the master volume so you get a direct line output from the radio or the cassette so that's how I was able to connect the scope, for example, uh, to do the uh, alignment on the cassette deck. Or you could play cassettes and digitize them into a computer or whatever you want to do. Or you could uh, connect the radio, if you want, to an external amplifier. So you've got both uh, options on that socket, but you have to use the DIN socket. And it isn't immediately obvious when you look at this switch and think it does something it doesn't like I did. So that's that. And again, just to reiterate from uh, what I did on the 8290 repair, if you want a really convenient way of bolting the sub chassis into the front panel, if you want to do some testing uh, with an external power supply and you want to work on it while it's powered up, uh, of course you can't use the mains, um, get a couple of spacers or something that can act as a spacer. I just have a few of these little white nylon spacers spare from another project and they, they come to just over half an inch together I think. Um, pop them over the screws and just put the screws back in so the screws will only go in at a couple of turns but it would just be enough you can't just put the screws on their own straight back in because you'll end up screwing them too far in uh, without the back panel naturally the back panel would have a, a standoff that would provide a bit of space there so you can fake it by basically using a couple of these spacers just to secure it down in order to do cassette alignment or cleaning of switches or any electrical testing that needs to be done so that was quite convenient but I should add to that don't forget to remove them before you try to put the back panel back on again I went over this on the 8290 repair but when you go to put the door back on don't forget this little spring if you can see in here you have to grab this with some ideally long nose pliers and pull it forward so that the um, arm for the door falls behind it because that's what uh, powers the uh, eject mechanism. Very much not easy to do but hopefully you can see now it's just in front of the door there so now I can push the door back into place and click it in properly otherwise you'll end up with a floppy eject. 
happens to all men at some point in their lives. Now you may notice on this that although the alignment's pretty decent, um, I'm getting a slightly different response between uh, left and right channel. And when the sweep comes up next, you'll um, you'll notice there's a point where it crosses. It looks okay, but it kind of one side kind of dips either side. Now that could be down to headwear. Um, there is definitely some wear on this head. Here we go. So you can see the discrepancy there between uh, left and right, blue is right. You can see they don't quite hit the same voltage until they go up to a, a point. There's not much in it, but it isn't as close as the 82 was. Now look, they start to even out. And then they actually go the other way. See the alignment's pretty tight, they do track together. But they do have a slightly different response to left and right channels. So I think that's everything. It's all bolted back up again. Um, it put up a little bit of a fight actually, this one, to get it back together again, to get the back on. Um, the first time I tried to get the back on I could feel a little bit of resistance round about where the transformer was and I sort of managed to get the screws in without too much fuss and that seemed to clear and then when I plugged it in it just made a horrible quick buzzing noise and I very quickly unplugged it, even with the volume down. I thought, oh no, what on earth have I done? Um, I took it back apart and uh, tested everything, went round, checked all the voltages and everything. Everything was fine, no blown fuses, no trouble, but it sounded like almost something had got shorted out. I kind of rearranged some of the wiring a little bit and um, the back went on much easier. So that's definitely something to be aware of. I think I kind of touched on that in the 8290 video that the, the way a lot of stuff was engineered in the 70s and late 70s when this would have been first prototyped and designed I guess. The wiring is often a bit of a rat's nest. It seems as though you have to wait until you get to the uh, later 80s and 90s before um, engineers start thinking let's use a flat ribbon cable and an edge connector or you know 20 way connector or whatever rather than doing it the 70s way which was let's use lots of separate bits of wire that tangle around everywhere. So. Routing wiring is so important um, in these and it's something you really have to take care of when you're trying to get them back together. If you feel any resistance, it's not right. If it's laid on its front, the back um, should drop on pretty snugly and pretty easily. and uh, It should lay flat without any screws in it. If you're having to put screws in to push it down, something's wrong. So just if you're putting one together, try and hold it and feel that there's no resistance there. Uh, when you uh, when you bolt it back together, but um, yeah, there is a slight discrepancy, as I say, between the channels. A slight tone difference that could be down to electronics, that could be down to um, headwear. Um, it's a strange one, this one, because the only conclusion I can come to is that it was. I think it's been used to play tapes, definitely, because there is, as I said, signs of head headwear, um, and the um, the pinch roller you can see again it's, it's marked so it has signs of use. My only thought with those bulbs being blown is that possibly someone left them on uh, as a bit of a display piece because again on the 8190 it latches on the 82 it doesn't you have to hold it it's a momentary button so um, the risk on an 8190 of blowing the bulbs out is far greater than an 82 
but they were both definitely burnt out so that's the only conclusion I can come to. If I'm going to be really picky the silver trim you may not be able to see it there it's just off shot it's ever so slightly unglued it's ever so slightly loose if it's touched. Now I could if I wanted if I was brave enough to try and tease that forward a little bit and get a little bit of glue under there I'm not brave enough I'm going to screw it up it's okay as it is, if you don't go poking and pulling at it, it's fine. If you try and pull it, you're liable to bend it. And aluminium, if you bend it, never ever goes back the right way. So, as it is, I'm not going to touch it, I'm going to leave it. Um, but other than that, did manage to get it all sorted. Um, it still sounds great. Um, pretty happy overall, really, with it. And uh, I hope that's of some help uh, to anyone who's got one of these. Again, if you're interested, watch... The previous video I did on the 8290, uh, which I, does have some mechanical differences. Uh, if you want to see through the whole lot, if there's anything I've missed in this that might be covered in there. Um, I can't remember everything, I'm not Superman, but uh, I hope what I've done there has been useful to someone. So thanks for watching.